Hello and welcome! Slowly, this turns out to be an unplanned mainboard repairathon, and today I have once again one socket 7 mainboard. This time actually nothing too exciting, but on the second side this board could give us some interesting topics. First of all, I would like to bring it back to life and then do a modification which I planned to do since uh, quite a long time already. Well, say hello to MSI MB8500 TVX mainboard. It is based on the Intel 430VX chipset and here below the CPU socket we have two linear voltage regulators for dual voltage CPUs. Such linear regulators get very hot, that's why they need those heat sinks, but at least you can use Pentium MMX CPUs on this board. Though I won't use anything faster than 166 MHz here if you don't want to boil water on those voltage regulators. As you can see this board misses some ICs, the BIOS ROM and the RTC module for clock and BIOS settings storage. Furthermore it has no cache tag IC installed, without which the cache wouldn't work on this board. The cache ICs themselves are still in place. Here about the CPU socket. This board was rescued from a scrapyard where the hardware is often thrown on top of each other. That's why first what usually breaks are the plastic hinges on the memory slots. And I'm surprised to see that on this board all memory slots look perfect, no damage whatsoever. On the back of the board there is only one small split right on the edge, which doesn't really affect anything. A trace nearby is totally fine. However, as I said, this board was rescued from a scrapyard where it was treated accordingly and so it was stroke by unavoidable. Some pins on one of the ICs were badly damaged. Probably another board was thrown on top of this one, hitting it with a corner here. The IC is an Intel S82438VX data path unit, which belongs to a set of ICs responsible for level 2 cache and main memory access. Quite an important part, as you can imagine. It belongs specifically to the i430VX chipset, but is actually easy to find because main boards with this chipset were produced in millions and are still easy to find on the scrapyard. Nonetheless, I would like to rescue this one if possible, so let's take a look under the microscope. So we have here three bent pins. One still looks good, but the other two... well... This one looks already like it is ripped out of the IC. Yeah, for this one every help comes too late. Okay, the other one I could straighten with a cutter knife. My tweezers didn't provide enough grip, unfortunately. Yeah, there is no short, that is good. I will have to solder the pads later anyway, but for this missing pin I'll have to rebuild the connection. Uh, that of course means drilling into the IC and solder a jumper wire. I freed both pads inside of the IC, because I want to check if the second pin, which still seems to be attached, is really connected to the internals. Unfortunately, I went a bit too far and slightly uncovered the traces, which goes um, to the next pin on the right as well. This will make soldering slightly more fiddly. Yeah, here we still have a connection. That's fine, but I'll try to enforce this connection though. Soldering the wire from the front is easier said than made, I solder it from above instead, because that way it's much easier to keep the wire stable in place. Mm -hmm. 
now the wire can be just flipped around and soldered to the pad. This will not win any beauty prize, but it should do the trick. The continuity looks also good. The pins left and right are not shorted to each other. Now it's time to give it a chance. I already found this mainboard in the Retro Web Project database. It is MSI MB8500 TVX, as I mentioned it before. Somebody removed all the jumpers previously, but with the help of the documentation on the Retro Web Project, I already could set all the jumpers as required. I will use this Pentium MMX200 CPU and all the jumpers are already set accordingly to dual voltage FSB to 66MHz and multiply to 3. The RetroWeb project was also helpful with the BIOS image. First one seems to have a different naming schema compared to the others, but I decided to take the second one, TVX1205A. To be honest, meanwhile I'm running out of EEPROMs or better to say EE prompts I see is, and will need to refill my stock. As for the RTC module, I had this benchmark BQ3287 right in front of me on the table. It has an empty battery, but it is sufficient to see if this board will post at all. Power supply. By the way, the cache tag is usually optional and this board should post without it as well. First of all, let's measure the CPU voltage. As I said, the jumpers are already set for dual voltage as Pentium MMX requires. And we have 3.4 volts for the I.O. and 2.9 volts for the CPU core. This seems to be right. Now let's check the clocks. This crystal delivers the main frequency for the clock generator, which generates uh, CPU, PCI and memory clocks. It is at 14.3 MHz, what is about right. Yeah, and here we have our 66.6 .6 MHz frontside bus for the CPU. Looks good. Time to insert the CPU. This board seems already to have the CPU fan connector, what just started to be a common feature back then. So, post analyzer card is already in place, let's add a PC speaker. And we have some numbers on the display, that is good, but no beep codes, that is less good. Let's add some memory and see if something changes. And yay, we have one long and eight short beeps. This means that memory check is through and the board is missing a graphics adapter. No problem, let's add one. And the board seems to post. We even have an output. Pentium MMX 200 MHz 16 MB RAM looks good so far. Well, battery low message was expected since the RTC module has an empty battery as far as I remember. Let's see if we can enter the BIOS. Yes, that looks uh, also good. 
Well, currently it makes no sense to set anything here, since with an empty battery the BIOS settings will not survive a reboot anyway. Time to replace the RTC module with one of my self-made NW3827 RTC modules with a new battery. This one is basically the same as this benchmark module, just with the accessible battery on top. Let's also add a compact flash to ID adapter to see if it will boot into DOS. And as you see, the CMOS battery low error message disappeared. Let's set the settings. I'll set all the IDE devices to be auto-detected. Let's see. The compact flash card is being detected as a secondary master IDE device. Well, this seems not to boot, though the hard disk geometry is being detected properly. Let's switch the compact flash to IDE adapter to another IDE port. Yeah, the compact flash card is now detected as primary master IDE device. Also, the disk geometry seems to be alright, but the system is still not booting. So, after some trial and fail I got it running. The solution was simple. I just tried different BIOS versions. The first one, this um, i25BSA01, it didn't even detect the hard drive. All the versions with A in the end did detect the hard drive, or better to say the compact flash card, but didn't want to boot the operation system. However, the version with B in the end turned out to be working, except TVX1016B which is uh, stated to be for SMC669 I.O. controller. My board has an UMC chip, uh, probably there were different versions with uh, different I.O. controllers. I would have to unpack the BIOS image uh, to tell the exact difference, but I didn't spend the time. The version TVX0619B turned out to be a success and DOS did suddenly boot properly. To be honest, I thought that the A in the end of the board's name would have something to do with the A in the end of the BIOS images, but my assumption was probably pointless, since only the ones with B in the end did work eventually. So, due to the physical damage of that memory and cache controller IC which I had to fix, the first thing which we should keep an eye on are obviously RAM and level 2 cache. Now the system has two memory modules, 8 MB each, so 16 MB total reported memory is right. Cache check reports only 16 KB of in CPU level 1 cache, but it seems not to detect any level 2 cache. This is most probably due to the missing cache tag IC. Let's run the obligatory for this channel Doom benchmark and see if it can finish successfully. And it finished the run with 965 ticks, that is about 80 FPS. Remember, this system has no level 2 cache and I did not tweak any BIOS settings at all. But for the test it's alright. So let's upgrade everything to see if we get a fully working system. The two memory models are inserted in the first two slots. Pentium has a 64-bit memory bandwidth. Each module is 32 bits, so we have to populate the memory modules in pairs to get to 64 bits. Let's add uh, two more modules, 8 MB each, into the upper two memory slots to see if those are working as well. Furthermore, I'll add a cache tag. The two SRAM ICs on the board are 128K each and are 7 nanoseconds fast. The cache tag should be actually just as fast, but the fastest I have are all 15 nanoseconds. I say that should be still able to handle it. The system could get unstable under heavy load or when overclocked, but for some simple tests this should be sufficient. And the mainboard detected 32 MB of RAM. That means that all four memory slots are working. Great! Let me pause the post for a second. This looks very promising. Up here it reports 256k of cache. That is really not much for its time, but this board has what it has. Down here it also reports external pipeline burst cache and, very important, all four memory rows are populated. I have two pairs of dual-sided memory sticks installed. Each side on a pair of sticks makes a row. So four rows is right and maximum what we can get on this board. 
This means that the repair attempt on that controller was a success. And cache check also reports 256k level 2 cache. Nice. Now let's run Doom benchmark once again now with level 2 cache. And it reports 883 real ticks. That is around 10 FPS more than before without level 2 cache. Once again, this is made without any optimization. Well, I would say this was a success. The controller seems to be alive. All the memory modules were completely detected. Also cache seems to run properly. Though the tag I see is a bit too slow, but it works. The short tests have shown that this board is back to life. Doom is running, off camera I made some more tests and couldn't find any issues. Actually, I could call it a day and move on to the next board. However, I would like to try out something on this board what I already planned to do for a long time. As you see, I used my self-made RTC module replacement and it is the best solution on most of such boards with a Dallas or similar modules. But there is something about this board what would allow to try out another solution. But this is something what I would like to try out in the next video. So if you liked this repair and are curious which torture I have in mind for this board, please join me in the next part. And this is it for today. Please don't forget that thumbs thing and I say thank you for watching and goodbye.